Welcome to our study, Play With Fire. Now you may be thinking, play with fire? We've been taught that if we play with fire, we'll get burned. But what I want to do is reclaim that. I've learned that the very thing that I thought would harm me actually freed me. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in a large Hispanic family, and as a first-generation American living in an urban environment, my parents made a critical decision to home educate us. But my mom was this free-flowing hippie, and she kind of had this very bohemian approach, if you will, to education. She didn't want to push her children to, to, to adopt to regular school systems. And so, I mean, we grew our own vegetables, not just out of necessity, but because Hello, she was a hippie, right? Well, growing up poor, I loved my educational background, but when I went into college, I said, I don't want to be poor ever again. In fact, I don't want to be like those people where I grew up where they wear Folex watches. I wanted to wear a Rolex watch, okay? But it wasn't until I enrolled in a literature class to study Greek mythology that something changed the course of my life. We studied the story of the phoenix. Phoenix was this beautiful mythological bird with colorful feathers and iridescent feathers that floated and flittered in the sun. This bird would sing beautiful songs to the sun, but also it was picked apart by those that wanted to destroy the bird. So the bird flew off into the desert. The bird, while in the desert, would sing songs to the sun to receive nothing more than silence. The bird, after years of singing in silence, built a nest and retired to the nest, and while there, sang its last beautiful song and erupted into flames. There was something about that story that just resonated with the season of my life. Uh, my life, too, was erupting in flames. My mom was diagnosed with two forms of cancer, 30% chance of living. I was at the end of a three-year dysfunctional relationship. I felt like I was losing my hope, I couldn't find a job, and I had to move back home. I felt like I was crying out to God like the phoenix cried out to the sun. And in sheer desperation, in the middle of a fire, I sang out the words, God, make me new again. Maybe you're like me and maybe you felt stuck. Maybe you feel like your life is erupting in flames. Or maybe you've survived the flames and now you want to tell people about this. My hope for you is that we go through these five sessions is that we won't be afraid of the fire or afraid of what seemingly looks dangerous. I want us to bravely and boldly enter the fire, believing that God will meet us in our midst. And what we'll discover is that the very thing we thought would harm us, God is going to use to redeem and refine us. So in this first session, we're going to be going on a little journey, a desert journey, if you will, alongside of the Israelites. And I want us to learn the difference in this first session between crying out and complaining, because we all are going to walk through the desert. And if you're not in a desert right now, maybe you've come out of a desert or you will be in a desert at some point. My desire is as hard as the desert can be, we are honest about where we are and vulnerable enough to share it. It is in our honesty and vulnerability that will lead us to crying out. Are you ready? Let's get this first session started. So if you know me, I know I'm very mature and serious and read, why are you laughing? I can already hear laughs. Okay, well the truth of the matter is, is I do like to read deep and meaningful books, but some of my favorite books have just been like very simple ones, like Oh, the Places We'll Go by Dr. Seuss. And let me read you one of my favorite passages. It says, and when you're alone, there's a good chance that you'll meet things that will scare you right out of your pants. There are some down the road between hither and yon, that can scare you so much you don't want to go on. And on this adventure of life, there are peaks and there are pits and there's valleys and sometimes in this adventure that God is inviting us onto, it's, it's a little scary. You could feel alone, you could feel forgotten, you could feel kind of tore up from the floor up, you just don't know which way you're supposed to go. I wanna encourage you on this adventure, don't fear the fire. Don't fear the invitation that God is giving us to walk into, to be transformed, and to experience the presence of God in those places where we feel this journey is a little scary. This journey feels a little dangerous. I don't know which way is up. Maybe you are in the middle. Maybe you feel between hither and yon, like Dr. Seuss will say. Maybe you feel like you're in the place between the not yet nor the has been, but you're just kind of lingering in the pit of the whale like Jonah, 
in the middle of the Sea of Galilee like the disciples, in the middle of the fire like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I want to tell you, we're going to go on a journey. We're going to be together, and I firmly believe that over the next couple weeks, whether in micro or macro ways, God can change our life. I believe in the God of the Bible, and I do, I'm so tired of seeing women and men and children live half-baked lives when we can walk in the fullness of the promises of our God, our own promised land, if you will. So instead of just walking around in drudgery or in slaves in Egypt or complaining in the desert, we walk in freedom. We walk in fullness. We, we snap, apparently, when we talk because we got that much confidence. As we go into this session on crying out, I want to clarify something very different, okay? There's a difference between crying out and complaining. We're going to see the Israelites cry out to God, but then their cry out turns into a complaint, a, a horrible, horrific complaint. And I empathize with them. There's no judgment here, okay? No judgment here because I, too, have been... That, that complaining, complaining person that's like, you've forsaken me, where are you? You've made these promises, you've coming, you're coming up short. I remember being in the middle of a quarter-life crisis. I remember uh, my, my mom being diagnosed with a terminal disease. I was in a, a broken relationship that was coming to an end. My younger sister was um, strung out on drugs. I was finishing up my senior year of college. I was hot mess express, y'all. Like, choo-choo. <laughs> I was going nowhere so fast. And there are moments in life where we want to tap out. We want to ring a bell. We want a bippity-boppity-boo. Something to change. And I, in that moment... I'm not Cinderella, I don't want to be Cinderella, but I did want a fairy godmother. I wanted someone to come over and sprinkle fairy dust and like, turn my pumpkin butt into a divine stagecoach that's going to take me off to this proverbial ball where life is going to be grand. We have these moments of life, but in those moments we can cry out. Not complain, but cry out. Transform me. I don't want to be this person anymore. I don't want to have these addictions anymore. I don't want to have these strongholds anymore. I don't want to go back to these broken relationships anymore. Or what if you're just stuck? I'm stuck. I'm doing the same thing again and again and again. What if you feel like you are at a pivot point in life and you're looking for God? I, I, I need to go in this direction. I just don't know what direction this is going. If you have those moments, well, in those moments, I don't know about you, holy, righteous people, but for carnal people, you may, may encounter, there's laughter, so I'm assuming I have some family members with my <laughs> carnal friends. We're on a road to transformation, friends. That's what matters. In those moments, have you ever asked yourself, God, are you there? God, can you hear me? God, do you care? In that moment, that was my dark night of soul, if you will. One of many, but in that moment, God began to re reveal what transformation looked like by paralleling the story of the Israelites. So I want us to go to Exodus chapter 2. We're going to go through just a couple verses, but I kind of want to pick them apart. And I am I'm a dorky list maker. And so as we go through these scriptures, I want you to pull out your Bible, pull out a notebook, pull out a pen. I actually color code my Bible, kind of dorky, don't judge. Judgment is bad. But if you want to do that, I encourage you to do that as well. Or ve I'm very excited to open up this text, which, yes, was written th over 3,000 years ago, and yet has transformational application to our life today. So in Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 through 25, it says this. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery, went up to God. I want you to underline groan, underline cried out, and underline cry. Those are very important, some key things that we'll see here. Look at those, look at those words. Groan, deep, a deep, languid cry from the depths of your heart, the depths of your soul, deep within your bowels, a groan, a cry out. And God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites, and he was concerned about them. Now, there's some background to this story that I want to get into. In the first chapter of Exodus, we see that there's a change in the situation. They weren't always slaves. They walked in, they began to multiply. And after 400 years, they had 
worked their way into captivity. Pharaoh at the time were oppressing them and mistreating them. There were hard taskmasters that were placed over them. They began to multiply so quick. It was like rabbits. Oh, their, their children are having children. Their children's children are having children. And so the Pharaoh was getting a little freaked out. He wanted to do away with an entire population, kill the babies. And for those babies that weren't killed, toss the boys into the Nile River. This is where the story picks up. The Israelites were slaves to the king who hated them, and in sheer desperation, I, I feel them, sheer desperation, what did they do? They cried out to God. They didn't complain to God. They cried out to God. And though I'd never been a slave, I can empathize with some of their tendencies, a feeling stuck, a feeling like we don't know where to go, and feeling of feeling like we are in a rut. I'm oppressed by maybe my own addictions or closet things that I don't want to confess to people. What are those things that we are enslaved to? I firmly believe that their cries are our cries, that their questions, God, are you there, are our questions today. Now, how does the book of Exodus address these amazing questions? Check out verse 24 and 25. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. These two verses answer the question, is God there and does God hear? In the Hebrew original language, for these two verses, only 15 words are used. Very interesting. And yet there's this one word that's used four times. Bear with me as we geek out, but this word is the subject as a verb. Let me break it down, okay? Hold on. I was homeschooled, but we could break this stuff down for everyone, okay? Because the subject is God, and the verb is what God does. Okay, you with me can't get an amen. amen. If you're taking note, God hears. God remembers. God sees, and God knows. So I want to break those four things down. And for our fourth and final point, guess how many other points are to that four point? Four, because I love simple things. Okay, simple things. Number one, in our road to transformation, the journey through the desert, please know that God hears every word that you cry out, everything that you say, it does not fall on deaf ears. Your words are heard by God Almighty. Check out the psalmist says in Psalms 34, 17. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears. And the promise that the prophet Jeremiah spoke out years ago pertains to us even today. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me and I will answer you. I love that. That was, that was just right for an amen. amen. Because there are sometimes I, I, I hold this. I'm calling out to you. You got to answer me because you promised me in your word. You promised me. Call to me and I will answer you. I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. There's a vital component in relationship and fellowship with God, and that is voicing aloud our need for him. Yeah. It's very hard for our culture. It's very hard for our generation. We make ourselves, we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, especially as Western, uh, Westerners. We do everything. We grab the bull by the horns. We ride that sucker until the ground. We did this. But sometimes it is in that uttering of saying, God, I can't do this. That that is the pivot point. That's the, the fire. That is the ember of transformation that's going to light ablaze your life for his glory. Amen. Number two, God remembers. Not only does God hear, but he remembers his promises. He made a covenant, not just with one. He made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and he foretold their imprisonment. Oh, man, I want to back this up a little bit to Genesis because there's this really interesting thing that I didn't see until I was studying this was that God foretold of the exact amount of years of captivity, 400 years. In Genesis 15, verses 13 and 14, then the Lord said to him, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in the country, not their own. Hello, Egypt. And they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. Hello, Pharaoh. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. Oh, yes. God foreknew and foretold what was going to happen to them. He prophesied deliverance. And that promise that God gave to the Israelites is yes and amen, as we are told in 1 Corinthians. He is faithful to those promises. He will not turn an eye to us. He works all things out for his good, and he is a keeper of his word. We're going to get into the promises of God. Point number three. God sees. 
Your God sees. He sees what is behind and he sees what is ahead. He knows that your past doesn't predetermine your present. He knows that your history does not determine your destiny. He knows. Your past is, is, is in the past for a reason. I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 94. Verse 7 starts off with the haters. The Lord does not see. The Lord of Jacob does not perceive. End quote. Ooh, here comes the fire. Understand, oh, dullest of people. That's the BIV, the Bianca International Version is, hey, yo, you sure is stupid, okay? You dumb. You special, not in a good way. Fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed an eye, does he not see? Our God sees everything. Fourth, and I think final and important note is your God knows. Our God knows. He knows your sin and my sin, your failures and my failures, your shortcomings and my shortcomings, as he knew the Israelites. He loved them and chose them in spite of themselves, not because of themselves. I hold on to that. I hold on to that because there are many days where I fall short, many days where I lose my cool, many days where I hate to admit it, that I doubt. But I come back to the promises of God. What I love, 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 love here is that the English, uh, the English language is quite limited. So in, in foreign languages and even in ancient languages, there are multiple words to describe one word that we would have in English. So this particular vo verse that we see, it's simply stated as God knew. So in verses 24 through 25, this, this, depending on the version of your Bible, it's going to be translated differently, but the original Hebrew and also in the ESV, it's simply stated, God knew. Now, how do we know this? This is backed up because there is a parallel verse in Exodus chapter 3, verse 7, and listen to what it says. And it uses the same verbs that we just looked at right now. It says this, then the Lord said in Exodus 3, 7, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering. Yeah. Ooh, our God hears, our God sees, our God remembers, our God knows. To know suffering, God intimately knew their pain, their sorrow, their confusion, the feeling of being alone and forgotten. And so as we go through this, I want to pull out four things that God knows. And I want us to hold on to that as we go into this week of homework. Number one, God knows their present weakness as he knows our present weaknesses. He knew that they could do nothing to help themselves. They knew, he knew that they needed him. And I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 103, 14. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Or what he told the disciples in John 15, 5. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's sometimes hard for us to reconcile because we want to hold on and I could do this. Look at how great it can do. And maybe you can bless your heart. You know what I realized in the South? When they bless your heart, they're really not blessing your heart. Yeah. They're really not. That's like saying, oh, your God is stupid, you know. So you could do it, bless your heart. Or you could do it with the power of the living God who has not forgotten you, who keeps his promises, who knows what your affliction. He sees you. So he saw what was going on. Number two, God knows their future failures and sins, as he knows ours. Now, this one's kind of weird for me, okay? Because it's like God is not ordaining this, but he knows this. He knew that he was going to remove them from captivity, free them. They were going to walk out and plunder as they left. They were going to take everything. They were going to head out. They were going to go into the desert. And he knew that they were going to complain, oh my gosh, you brought us, literally, oh my God, you brought us here into the desert and we're going to die because the Egyptian army is coming after us. Nope, because then the Red Sea parts and they walk through on dry land. Oh, God is good. We're singing hallelujah. But then their crying out turns into complaining. Oh, we're here again. Why do we have to do this? All this stuff's going on. So then they get the Ten Commandments. Ooh, straight from God. Here are some rules. We obey. We're going to be our best. We are holy. Praise God. Hallelujah. I go to church every Sunday. And then shown up a couple days later, what did they build? A calf made out of gold. How quickly we forget. God knows our sin, shortcomings, and failures. But it doesn't preclude us of him using us. Because child of God, 
Revelations 12, 11, you will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. Amen. How good is God? Even when we fall short, even when we're pockmarked or fail, God still chooses to use us. Amen. How good is God? Number three, God knows the power of our enemy. God knows the power of the enemy, whether uh, the power is physical or uh, maybe a disease or oppressive state, whether it's a human enemy or our spiritual enemy, God knows. He knows what was going to happen tomorrow. He knows what's going to happen the next day. He knows what's going to happen the day after that. The author of Hebrews puts it this way, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. God knows our actions and our hearts. And it doesn't limit us. It causes him to love us. And finally, God knows the plan for the Israelites as he know, knows the plan for us. Moses was put into a, a carrier, into the Nile, removed from the Nile, placed into royalty, grew up, it grew up, growed up. He <laughs> growed up. Yes, he did. He grew up in the palace. He saw his people being mistreated, one of who was murdered, and he himself became a murderer to defend his people. He fled into the desert. There in the desert he was married, and he came into a family, and there he encountered a bush, which we will get into. It was an invitation for him to take a step forward. God knew everything that was going to happen. God declares through the prophet Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for wholeness and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. So what are your sorrows? What are your pains? Think about what are those things that you have been crying out to God for or need to cry out to God to deliver you from. What are those sorrows? What are those pains? And know that God sees God hears, God remembers, and God knows. So persevere as you go through the fire. Persevere and don't give up. Don't grow weary in doing good. And when we ask, when we cry out in our weaknesses, he shows up with his strength so that we can say, when I am weak, then I am strong. Because we are filled. We are filled with the spirit of the living God to do what he's called us to do on this road, on this journey, on this transformation. So if you're with me for the next couple weeks, I hope and I pray that God shows up magnanimously to change and transform our lives when we play with fire.